get started. Um, my name is Dave Grisanti, and I'm a principal engineer at Comcast. And there's a lot of other fellow Comcasters here. Um, I know some of you, some of you I don't. Um, and I'm going to talk today about uh, my journey with DevOps over the last year and a half um, at Comcast. So first, I want to go over a little bit about the application I work on um, and how it fits into this into this talk. So uh, it's called Elements. It's a notification service, uh, pub sub style, similar to Amazon SNS. I think Tony mentioned that a little bit uh, a while ago in his talk. The general idea being clients publish traffic over HTTP to an endpoint on, on a topic, and we send that traffic out over HTTP to some endpoint or to mobile devices, uh, Apple or, or Android. Um, and the topics here can range from you know, whatever the client wants. Uh, generally, the traffic that we support uh, are things like caller ID, SMS, SMTP, uh, email, for all Comcast customers, and some Xfinity Home events. So the usage of the service is about 100, hundreds of millions of publishes per day. There's a lot of traffic. And delivered in a, about 500 milliseconds. So the, the general idea is the uh, events are, need to be timely. We don't store anything. So like if you, anybody has voice service, if you're at home and you're getting a phone call and you see the pop on your X1, if that comes three minutes after your phone call happened, then customers aren't going to be very happy. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, Xfinity Home Events is an, another big use case for us um, and, and phone calls. So people are probably used to what uh, events look like on iOS before. This is an example of like if one of your uh, doors opens at home, you can get notified um, with iOS or Android saying, hey, your door is open. Or if your alarm is going off, um, those events are going through, going through elements. Um, and this is what a sample of an X1 event would look like if people are not familiar. Uh, software stack-wise, the application is written in, in Scala, and we are using uh, Akka Actors and Google Protobufs for serializing the data between the different, uh, different adapters. The, some of the decisions were made before I joined the team, and I'll, and I'll get a little bit into that, but the nice thing about the Protobufs is it does allow us to uh, write the adapters in different languages if we wanted to, uh, moving away from Scala. Uh, stateful data-wise, we are storing the subscriber details and the uh, topic stuff in Couchbase. Um, so we don't, going back to the last, last talk, we don't do many changes to Couchbase. And the nice thing, since it's a document store, we don't have to worry about schema changes very much. Um, and that's, that's pretty static. But Couchbase has been pretty stable for us uh, along the way. So a little bit of application architecture to go over. Uh, like I said, HTTP, HTTP calls come into the endpoint. Um, we call this publish. There's a set of um, core servers that we call PubSub, and each of the published components has a persistent connection to these, to these core servers. So when a request comes in, it gets round robined to one of the, the core servers, which handle doing, looking up the subscriptions and then doing the routing to the, the endpoint adapters. So kind of flipping on the other side, these PubSubs get a message, and they have some persistent connections out to another adapter, whether it be uh, webhooks for the HTTP posts, or uh, the mobile adapter for the iOS and Android delivery. So one of the pieces I'll touch on a little bit here is that these persistent connections create a little bit, a little bit of a challenge for us when moving off um, static VMs and going into the, into the container world. So now that we talked about the application a little bit, when I started last year um, in June, there was a, a big push to kind of modernize the Elements application. And um, change the team, and also make the application more of a platform. So when it was originally built three or four years ago, uh, it was very custom for a lot of the use cases within the company. It wasn't very flexible, and there was a lot of custom business logic built in, and the, the desire was to you know, allow more people at the company to use it um, in some generic case. Um, and then the other big thing was there was a lot of silos with dev and ops, and um, management at the time wanted to kind of consolidate everybody in and do DevOps, <laughs> which I know is a common theme. But the, the goal was to consolidate teams as much as it was to modernize the infrastructure and the delivery. So I got brought on to kind of lead the team, uh, both from like a software perspective and also for this, this kind of transition period. So um, I want to go over a little bit of where we're starting from uh, with the application before I jump into kind of the, the process that we took to to get to where we are today. So I guess a lot of people probably deal with this, but a lot of the stuff that we do day to day 
uh, for the existing application was all based on tickets. So if we wanted to make any changes to VMs, get a new VM, take anything down, make load balancer changes, everything was putting a ticket into JIRA and waiting two days. Um, so that was, that's not ideal, obviously, for anybody. Um, and it specifically caused some problems for us when we have issues with the application or issues with the clients. You know, if we want to shift things over to different data centers, we've got to manually take down one data center just to ship traffic since we can't make changes. Um, manual build and pushes of RPMs. So we did have some uh, Puppet involved in the process, but even that, you would check out a repo, make the changes, make a PR, push it, and then wait a couple hours to, it, to appear on the Puppet server. And there was no um, CI CD at all. There was some tests at the Developers wrote for unit tests, but no, um, nothing would run when you push a PR, and there was no auto deployment. Everything was, was manual. Um, in terms of load balancing, I mentioned this a bit, but uh, hardware load balancing, and there was no dynamic way of shifting traffic. So the, we had to put a ticket in, and if we had any problems with clients um, or wanted to take a data center offline, we, we had to do it, had to wait or do it manually. The Adapters I mentioned at the beginning that were kind of that centerpiece, they, the application and the protocol that's used to send messages back and forth assumed that that's a, basically a static set of servers. You could add new ones, but you could never take away old ones. And the assumption was that the IPs or the ports would never change. So if a server went down, the clients would assume that it could reconnect to it at some point in the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So uh, we couldn't really scale up or scale down those servers, unless we wanted to restart the application and make configuration changes and check in new code. So no service discovery, if people are familiar with that term. So that was something that we were looking for as we moved into the new world. Uh, logging and metrics. This is something that the, was more of an afterthought, I think, and I think that it's like that for a lot of people. So the the, the Motto was really log everything and we'll figure out what we want to do with it later. Um, it, it, to the point where the collection of metrics and the alerting on the application was a Perl script that somebody wrote that they would run every five minutes to scrape all the logs and send that data somewhere. So if that ever crashed, you know, we would get woke up in the middle of the night saying the thing collecting the logs is crashing. Um, so not, not ideal at all. Um, and then everything would get stuck into an Elasticsearch um, instance that we could search for actual, you know, troubleshooting, but the metrics piece being on the logs, I think, is a common theme that we also wanted to kind of shy away from. So I think the general thing was we have pets. Pets are bad in this case. Um, go with cattle. So uh, team structure-wise, the team's pretty small. It was only six or seven people when I started, including me, and. This included, well, let me step back. The, the dev team and QA team was six or seven people. The ops team was a separate team in a you know, different geographic region that was doing all the ops for us. So it was the traditional, like, kind of throw it over the wall. They kept their own configuration that wasn't checked into our Git repo to deploy the app and, and manage it. And QA was you know, in the same uh, geographic region as us, but they were still kind of separate. So you know, work on a feature check it in, it, it's ready, and then they write some tests on it after the fact. So, so some, I think early decisions that we came up with um, was, or at least the first thing was, was, a, was a team thing. So the, the idea was, let's get everybody who's gonna do all the tasks, ops, QA, dev, everybody's gonna be in the same place, and everybody's gonna do everything. You know, we'll teach the devs how to do ops, we'll teach the QA people how to do dev, everything will be perfect. Um, and everybody was like, yeah, that sounds great, including all the people on the team. As you can, foreshadowing that didn't work out super well. Um, and then the other decision from an infrastructure perspective was to, to use containers, which I think is a common theme of what people are going with nowadays, but there's still some VMs um, in the picture, which I'll get to in a second, but the, the general idea was running everything in Docker. So Docker, and then for, um, I guess the container orchestration piece, we decided to go with Apache Mesos and, and Marathon. And a couple of these decisions were influenced by uh, experiences that people on our team, specifically the systems engineers, had with another project at Comcast. They had success with going with this model. So that was why we kind of chose it in the beginning. Um, we've since 
you know, played with some other things, but we've still kind of stuck with this. And even not using DCOS, just staying with Mesos and Marathon. And then from a networking perspective, we're using uh, Weave, which is a, a Docker uh, overlay networking for uh, multi-host uh, connections and HAProxy from a load balancing perspective. From the infrastructure side, we're using the OpenStack installation at Comcast, uh, specifically VMs, and CI/CD. we are using uh, Jenkins. And I think it was mentioned earlier, we're, we are using the, the pipeline feature uh, with Groovy now, which has been nicer than kind of maintaining a bunch of uh, jobs manually like I was used to with Jenkins in the past. So when we started this process, I think there was, a, in the beginning, there was some quick, kind of quick wins that we found with some of the tooling we were using that made things a lot easier. So uh, Scala has a, a build tool called SPT, it stands for Scala, Scala build tool, that does a lot of the Docker file uh, building for you. So instead of having to have a Docker file in your repository, you can put all of the, the directives for it, the ports, you, the ports you want to expose, what your registry is, um, any details that would normally go in the Docker file can kind of live in this, this, this build file that you normally would have with a Scala project. And running a, a SPT command, it'll build the container for you and put your app inside there, make it executable, and all you need to do is do Docker run and everything is, everything is kind of there for you. Uh, and then on the Jenkins and Marathon side, Jenkins has some good plugins for both for SPT and also for Marathon. So in that, in that uh, pipeline script in Groovy, you can build your container and then push it to the registry and launch it in Marathon you know, only in a couple steps. Um, so the interacting with the API was, was pretty simple. And from a, an infrastructure kind of viewpoint, you can represent what the Marathon uh, environment looks like within a, the Marathon JSON file and have that checked into your repository. Have Jenkins use that to launch. So the things like the container image you're using, the port mappings, you know, your health checks, how many instances you're running, how big they are, all that can all live inside the repository. So you can represent you know, your code and the infrastructure all in, in one place. But I, I think we quickly realized that the, there were some niceties, but we definitely started running into some issues early on. Um, so one of the things that I think teams do, I've heard other people use this term before, is wargaming. So early on, before we made really any application changes, we decided you know, we'll containerize everything, we'll throw it in the environment, and then we'll just try to pick it apart, like throw lots of traffic at it, take containers down, see what breaks. Um, and one of the first things we realized was visibility into the containers is a, is a pain. And I think this is, now that where I'm at now, that's kind of an obvious thing. But I think with people coming from the traditional uh, VM world where you ha you're running like four or five of them, you can SSH into them and just like tail logs and it's, it's easy, but that's not very easy at all in containers. So from the Marathon UI perspective, you know, you can use their tools to get like copies of your logs by clicking on um, the logs per instance, or you can use the Mesos UI to get to search for your container and then follow this sandbox link and then to get a streaming copy of your logs, but still that's like one instance, not, not, super, not super usable on a large scale. And Along with the, the, the visibility thing, one of the other things we saw early on was a pretty significant decrease in performance from, from the application. So in the, the legacy world, we were able to process a couple thousand um, requests per second on a single VM, and we were seeing like, you know, 100 or 200, like crazy worse performance. So we knew something had to be up since we didn't make any code changes. So the, the kind of the, the path there was, let's pick things and see what could possibly be the problem. So the first thing we thought of, well, maybe it's the, it's, it's Weave, it's the Docker networking piece. Poked around with that for a while, it, it didn't seem to be that. You know, could it just be Dockerizing the app in general? We've added a, you know, a whole other layer of virtualization on top. Um, HAProxy, that didn't seem very likely. So <clears throat> after kind of poking around at each of them and not figuring it out, we kind of scrapped the plan of pointing fingers and we just started from scratch, like take a bare VM, install Docker on it, run the app, do we have the problem? slowly build things back up. What we eventually found was it was the logging driver we were using. Um, so to solve the visibility problem, we started shipping all of our logs to Greylog. And specifically the Gelf driver for, for Greylog that Docker was using had a bug in the CPU, uh, or sorry, in the compression um, 
algorithm, and it was taking up all the agent, all the Mesos agent CPU. So that was taking all that away from the app and things weren't working. So we turned off the compression and then the performance went back to normal. So it was just a very rabbit hole of a process to find something you, you know, wouldn't obviously think of in the beginning. Um, next was really the service discovery piece. And this is more of an application problem, not an infrastructure problem, but it was something that we knew we'd have to solve by moving off of the, the static set of servers. So the way uh, the adapters connect to that core PubSub piece is kind of this mesh network. Every adapter makes a connection to every core server, and that's on both sides, you know, the receiving side and then and the, the out, outbound side. So because the protocol was built to assume some set of known servers, we knew we'd have to adapt that a bit. And the way the, the legacy system worked was using Zookeeper. And it followed a pattern where at startup, it would register itself with Zookeeper. And then Zookeeper would we'd register itself and register a callback. Zookeeper would give it back a full list of all of the, the core servers that were running. Um, the client adapter would have to know about at least one PubSub server in the environment when it started. It would connect, and then it would get a list back of all the servers, and then it would make connections everywhere. And then this, the server's message would come back every five seconds and let it know, like, here's the list of servers you should be connecting to. So if we ever added any, it could connect. But the, like I said, the protocol didn't have any ability to, to like, forget servers. So in the new world, we knew that this wouldn't really work. Um, mostly because of the way that you know, Docker's exposing networking locally and on the host. So you know, your containers have some um, private address space that they know about with the application. So we have two containers running. They've got some 172 address with the, the application port. You know, and they can expose ports that are accessible outside of the container, but those are random. Like They change every time we launch, launch the application, and we didn't want to be restricted to running you know, only one instance of the app on the host at a time. So we didn't want the app responsible for registering itself in Zookeeper anymore. We wanted some kind of external service discovery option. So we decided to, to go with, with console. And along with console, we're running um, basically a, a Docker discovery process uh, on each Mesos agent called Registrator, which supports more than just console, but it can pay attention to when containers are starting up on Docker, and then it'll take care of registering that service for you in console or, or deregistering when it stops. So you can basically ask console for a list of um, servers by service name. So the, the general model that we kind of landed with stays largely the same. Um, PubSub will ask console for the list of all the servers. Um, the client adapter now, instead of having to know about an initial one, will just connect to console, ask for the list. They'll then make connections to all of them. And then that server's message is still coming back every five seconds to say, you know, here's any new uh, servers that have started up, or if a server has, will fall off the list, if the client disconnects from it, we won't try to reconnect again. So it's kind of this rolling list of, of servers if we decide to scale them up or down, or if the whole environment crashes and it comes back up again. Uh, from the operational visibility perspective, I called this logging and metrics before. This is like a, a fancier term for, for that same thing. This is something I think has been getting you know, more attention lately. I know within Comcast we've been talking about it a lot. And the general idea here is we want the, the application from the beginning to be kind of responsible for metrics it's going to expose so that we can find out what's going on without having to scrape logs or like have someone go in and do a query on a logging interface. Um, I know a lot of people are used to using something like Splunk, which does a lot of this stuff for you, but it's also really expensive. Um, so in our case, we weren't fortunate enough to use that, so we were kind of stuck with coming up with our own solution. So we decided to take a look at, at Prometheus. Um, for those who aren't familiar with this, it's a, it's a time series database um, that also has a pretty powerful uh, query language built on top of it. And the idea here is it's, it's a pull model versus a push. So your application exposes some metrics endpoint with data formatted that Prometheus understands. And Prometheus has a bunch of scraper nodes that will just scrape your application. Um, and you can either give it a set of static endpoints, or in our case, we just point it at console and say, here's the, app, you know, here's the set of apps we want you to uh, scrape metrics for. And the, the data model uh, on Prometheus' side is you have a, a unique metric name and then a set of labels. And those labels can be things like environment, app name, uh, anything you want. What the HTTP method is, so in this example, this is like an HTTP server method. Um, and the, the basic types they have are counters. So in this case, this would be a counter. It's 
saying like, okay, there's three of these entries and here's the, the timestamp it was at. Or you can do things like histograms for tracking uh, you know, request times. And then you can do graphs with it. Um, I kind of avoided doing some crazy huge graph and just said this is super simple. Like here's HTTP posts over a time period. But the nice thing is you don't have to do this based on the, on the logs and you know, it's, it's, there's other models obviously using Influx and pushing data with StatsD, but for us this model worked pretty well. That's why the apps is not responsible for pushing data and Prometheus can scale pretty widely. Uh, from the logging perspective, we stuck with Graylog and obviously everybody still needs logs for debugging. Um, our other choice was Kibana and um, personally I like actually like Graylog better. I think their interface is nicer. Their, the metrics visibility and graphing is a little nicer and easier to use um, and the searching is a little bit more user friendly. Um, but it's still backed by Elasticsearch. So in the end the data is really still living in the same spot. So lastly, uh, I just want to talk about what happened with the team. So I think in the beginning I showed a similar team picture. This is more teamwork focused. Um, there were still about six, six, seven people at the mix, like I said, of dev, QA, and, and ops. And I think what I learned in the last year and a half is with people, with a team of mixed skill sets, mixed backgrounds, people's like ability and, you know, willingness to do something is not necessarily correlate with how well it gets executed. So we had a lot of people who, who you know, had the willingness to jump into functional programming or jump into being on call, but didn't, it didn't really fit well with, with them, with the way that they worked and, and their personality. And then in the other case, we had a lot of people who um, were capable of doing it, but didn't necessarily value it, I think, as much. So like, in our case, we had some developers who were like, I could do ops, but I don't really want to. I just want to work on development cards. So I think in the beginning, our, our, our management was very big on this you know, cross-training, everybody learning everything. They were very patient in the beginning. We did a lot of pair programming, a lot of you know, sitting with people for a while uh, to come up to speed. But as time went on and the project wasn't moving as fast as they wanted, the, the patience kind of was wearing out. So what you ended up seeing lately is that when you look at our Trello board of cards, the devs are doing the dev work, the QA is doing the QA work, and the ops are doing the op work. It's not as much. There's a couple people who float in and out, but for the large part, people kind of stayed in their traditional silos, even though it's still one team, but um, you know, we lose one developer or lose one ops person, unless it's super well documented, people don't necessarily know uh, where to look when you know, our, our pager duty goes off, since everybody's on call. Uh, so, so lastly, just some takeaways. Uh, so logging and metrics from the beginning, I think that's definitely important. Uh, declarative configuration management, so this idea of inf infrastructure as code, teamwork and, and willingness to adapt both from people and the application perspective and also just being mindful when trying to transform teams with, with mixed skill sets. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to mention was there's a lot of stuff that I kind of glossed over um, you know, we're building a new greenfield deployment. We've still have this legacy app that we have to migrate all these customers. We've got like 50 million devices sitting in our database. So if anybody's curious about that, um, you know, catch me after. Um, app transformation wise, we made a lot of code changes to make this more of a platform versus the business logic stuff that was in there before. And then just the infrastructure details, like we're managing most of the Mesos Marathon stuff ourselves, uh, HA proxy, blue green deployment, all that stuff I, I kind of didn't cover just given the time. But uh, that's it.